Hey, I'm Dev Poodle. A couple months ago, I attempted to recreate Deltarune's combat system in Godot. Since then, I've put a bunch more time into my recreation. This is the state the project was in at the end of the previous video. Here, that? No, nothing. There was no sound effect or music system implemented. There also was only one character, and they didn't use magic, so there wasn't a proper magic system either. Today, I'll walk you through the past few months of changes and improvements I've made. Hopefully you'll learn something along the way and have some fun. So first off, I gotta say, I received a ton of very useful feedback, both on the GitHub repo and the comment section of my last video. As of me writing this, 22 issues were opened, 18 of which were all by the same person, Zenith909. If you're watching this, thanks so much for all the bug testing, it really helped quite a lot. As for the video, it had 35 comments, many of which contained feedback on the project. I'll be mentioning some of these issues and comments throughout the video, so I just really want to thank everyone for the feedback. Alright, enough of this noodling around, let's get to some actual changes. The first thing that I felt needed to change was the sound effect system, or I guess the lack of one. Turns out that sound and music are quite important in a turn-based RPG, who would have guessed? <laughs> there were quite a few things I wanted the sound effect system to be able to do. First of all, it should manage every sound in the game. I want there to be one universal script for playing sound effects and music. Specifically, an autoload they can call from anywhere in any script. This would make recreating Deltrin sound easier, because dealing with Godot's audio notes tends to be quite annoying, at least for me, and I'd like to simplify it as much as possible. Another important restriction is how sound files are imported. I, of course, don't have copyrights to any of Deltarune's sound effects or music. That, plus me wanting to keep the git repo as light as possible, made me avoid including any of it directly in the project. Instead, you have to either extract the sounds from your purchased copy of Deltarune, or use a site like Sounds Resource to download them. Because of this restriction, I had to make sure none of the scripts directly reference a file path to any sound or music file, and that ideally, you could simply drag and drop in your sounds folder. So how does the sound effects system work in Deltarune? While I don't know how Deltarune handles the file management part, I do know how playing sounds works in scripts. It's actually fairly simple. From anywhere you can call sound play, passing in the name of the sound, and then settings like pitch and volume. Let's get into how I actually implemented this then. So there's an auto load at the start of every project called sounds. It has the functions play sound and play music, which when called play a sound or change the current music track. It does this by searching a dictionary, mapping the names of sounds to their corresponding audio stream notes, and then playing those. This list of audio nodes is generated automatically at runtime. When the project starts, I search through every single file under the sounds folder and create a new node for it based on the file name. After implementing this, I then had to go through each script and added a bunch of calls to play sounds when they're supposed to. It really, really livened up the project and made it feel more like Delta, while being fairly easy to code. I'll definitely be considering adding similar sound systems to any games I make in the future. Speaking of systems, one of the things I've worked on recently is the magic system. Before, and I'm not joking about this, the entire magic system was basically just an empty function, and I wanted to create a proper spell system instead. For the system, I wanted to make sure you could give the same spell to multiple characters without having to rewrite anything. So I created a new spell resource, from here I then made a basic attack and basic heal spell. I tried to keep these all as simple as possible. With these spells made, I needed a way to test it out. Previously, there was only one character implemented in my recreation, a blue robot made to stand in for Chris. Since they're the main character, they used acts instead of spells. To use spells, I created a new character, a red robot made to stand in for Susie. They have access to the new attack and healing spells. I also added a new battle customization screen at the start of the game, which allows you to swap between different characters. Anyways, I have a bit of a confession. While I have tried to introduce a bunch of new features to the game, in reality, most of the time I've spent working on it in the past few months has been towards fixing bugs and polishing up bits of the UI. So before we get back to features, let's do a quick fix intermission. I'll run through the most interesting little bugs and issues I came across as quickly as possible. Unnormalized soul movement. This helpful commenter let me know that the soul's movement in Deltarune is unnormalized. If you don't know, a common mistake when coding top-down movement is making moving along diagonals faster than moving straight up and down or left and right. To solve this, you have to normalize the player input before adding it to velocity. This means the player will move at a constant speed no matter which direction they choose. I just assumed Deltarune was doing it, but it apparently isn't. Moving along diagonals is about 1.4 times faster in the real game, so I made that the default in my recreation as well. Mixing up local resources. When passing around data or code between different nodes, Godot uses objects called resources. One of the nice things about resources is that they're passed by reference. So, for example, you can have multiple UI elements that all reuse the same background panel, and if you change one, it changes all the others. This is normally quite helpful, but what about when you want to change them separately in-game? Well, to do this, you have to check the local to scene checkbox in the settings of your resource. Turns out, I forgot to do this for quite a few UI objects, leading to stuff like this bug. 
where all the health bars were turning red when only one character's health got too low. Zero HP characters surviving. Yep, I checked for the health being less than zero rather than less than or equal. Ah, I love programming. Let's just move on to the next one. Crashes and soft locks. Oh, this is somehow even worse than the last one. Because the entire battle system is a very UI driven system, where menus are regularly popping up and closing, and you know, it's all keyboard based, it's very easy to accidentally code in softlocks. If an animation somehow gets skipped, or I just forget to give back focus to whatever menu is open, then you just can't do anything. Fingers crossed I've gotten rid of them at this point. The bottom panel script. Alright, this is the final part of the quick fix intermission, and oh boy is it not a quick fix. Because I was in a bit of a rush when making the first video, almost all UI code in the entire game got crammed into a single script handling the bottom panel. And worse, even the code that was put into other scripts was frankly spaghetti. A big part of my work since publishing it has just been trying to clean it up as much as possible. The UI code as a whole is still pretty bad, but some parts have been made better. Like, I created a base class for pretty much all the menus in the game, which allowed me to simplify their individual scripts and use the typing system to make it nicer to work with. As for the bottom panel script itself, I've reorganized parts of it to be cleaner. Doing stuff like separating out different functions and simplifying match statements has helped quite a bit. Alright, we're done with the quick fix intermission. Let's get back to a more fundamental part of the recreation, the API for creating new characters and enemies. Previously, because I was in a bit of a rush, my idea was to keep the base character and enemy classes as simple as possible. They'd basically just be a big list of virtual functions to be overwritten by a dedicated script for the new character you wanted to add. While this worked for one character, when I started thinking about adding a new one, namely the red robot, I pretty quickly realized this just wasn't good. There's so much shared functionality between basically all characters you could want to create. The main reason why I went for such a loose system in the first place was because of animations. So I'd assumed that creating a more unified base character class would be too restrictive. In hindsight, this was wrong. Being so loose with the base class made everything more complex, not less, and I had to find a way to fix it. I didn't want to force the developer to use an animation player. And even if they do use an animation player, I don't want to force them to have to follow a bunch of specific rules. Like, your animations must all follow this specific naming scheme, and this set of animations are mandatory, or this set are optional, because it would ultimately just make things a lot more confusing and remove some of the freedom. Instead, I kinda went for a middle ground solution. Now, the only function you have to implement for a basic character is this doAnimation function. It provides a code corresponding to some animation, and it requires you to return a signal that will emit when the animation finishes. This alone was enough for me to completely remove literally all of the other stuff necessary to make a character. I mean, it took the blue character script from 16 overrated functions down to just three. And the doAnimation function isn't even particularly hard to implement. If you're going for a basic animation player solution, then it's just a simple match case, and you just return the animation player's built-in signal for when an animation completes. Keep in mind that although I focused on the character scripts, I later applied pretty much all of these changes to the enemy scripts as well, drastically simplifying the creation of new enemies. With all of these simplifications, the character and enemy APIs are finally in a state that I'm happy with. They're not, you know, great, but I've tested it out, and it's pretty easy to create new characters from scratch, so long as you have some decent pixel art skills, which I do not. But programmer art works just as well. I've written a little bit of documentation on creating a new character. It's in the docs folder of the Git repository, so if you're interested in trying this out for yourself and you need some help, then make sure to read that. Alright, I think that's all I wanted to say in this video. The link to the Git repository with this project is in the description. Uh, I'm taking a little break from any more major updates. I mean, I'll still look at it every once in a while, but it's certainly not a priority. If you want to test out the project, there's a playable web version on itch.io that will also be linked in the description. Please feel free to use any of this project for anything. I really don't mind whatever you choose to do with it, just make sure to let me know if you make anything cool with it. I love seeing people making stuff with what I've shown in my videos. Well, if you liked the video or want to see more, I'd appreciate a like or a sub. I'll try to respond to the questions or suggestions you may have, so feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments. I'm DevFoodle, I'm really really glad you watched this, and goodbye!